All right, uh, welcome back to the uh, online causal inference seminar. Today, we're very excited to have uh, Sam Pimentel from uh, UC Berkeley, who will talk about optimal trade-offs in match designs comparing US trained and internationally trained surgeons. As usual, if you have questions, please submit them via Q&A. Uh, after the talk, uh, we're gonna have a discussion by Magdalena uh, Bennett from UT Austin. You may have also noticed that there are some uh, new moderators. So we have now also Georgia, Emma, and Chinguan, uh, who will help out. So you might uh, see some new faces here. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, Michael, who will handle uh, questions today. Uh, so as Dominic said, submit your questions through Q&A. Uh, if you have uh, an issue that you raise with the panelists, you can uh, submit that through chat. But all questions should go through Q&A. Um, and uh, Sam will uh, stop once or twice during his presentation uh, to receive questions. And uh, we may reach out to you uh, and ask if you'd like to ask your question live. And just keep in mind that the talk is being recorded if you choose to ask your question live. So with that, Sam, please uh, start whenever you're ready. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Dominic. Let's share my slides here. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, delighted to have this opportunity to present. Uh, I'm going to share some joint work with uh, Rachel Kells, who is in the Department of Surgery at Penn Medical School. And uh, I also like to acknowledge some support we received from the Department of Defense. This, uh, this work has kind of a, a, a substantive applied piece to it, as well as a, a methodology piece. And those are kind of focused on respectively in these two different papers in the Annals of Surgery and in JASA. I'm gonna focus a little more on the methods today, but I wanna start by uh, with, the, with the application just to keep things uh, concrete and focused here. So uh, in the United States, about 15% of the practicing surgeons are international medical graduates, uh, meaning that they received their medical degree outside the United States. And then they took a, a US-based certification exam that allowed them to compete for the same US postgraduate uh, training programs that uh, U.S. medical graduates uh, participate in. Um, so first of all, there's this difference in where their medical education happened and under what system it occurred. In addition, once uh, uh, surgeons enter this uh, postgraduate training, IMGs or international medical graduates end up experiencing having a different experience than USMGs in general. They're much less likely to be placed into their top program. They're more likely to split their training among multiple programs. Um, and so uh, the big picture is that IMGs and USMGs are both out there practicing, but they, the path that they sort of walked to becoming a practicing surgeon was very different. And so we were really interested in whether this has any implications for patient outcomes. Um, as a patient, if you're being treated by an IMG versus a USMG, does that have implications for uh, whether you're more likely to develop uh, complications after your surgery? And if there are different systematic differences here, that could have implications for how surgeon training should be designed or, uh, or altered. Um, so in particular, we're focusing on the question of whether receiving surgery from an IMG versus a USMG changes the risk of 30-day uh, mortality. So before I talk about how we actually uh, tackled this question and the data we had available, I want to talk about kind of the ideal study design, at least um, from a statistician's perspective for this, which would be, uh, in my view, to conduct a randomized trial. So I'm imagining something very simple here. You, you could have an IMG and a USMG on call at a hospital. Uh, every pair of patient that comes in, you flip a coin, and if the coin comes up heads, the first patient is treated by the IMG, the second by the USMG, and if it's tails, you do it the other way around. Um, obviously, I'm uh, hand-waving away a lot of really uh, important practical details here, but from the statistical perspective, this is a good idea because it guarantees that we have comparable groups of patients or of operations being performed on patients, right? The, these coin flips can't systematically sort older or sicker patients into one of the arms. And so uh, any systematic difference we see in mortality has to be attributable to the, uh, the difference in the surgeons who are performing the, um, the surgery. Okay, so we didn't do a randomized trial. Instead, we uh, used a, a big uh, observational data set to get at this. And our data set was constructed from medical claims uh, for general surgeries in the Orlando area over a four-year period. So this is kind of a, a census of the surgeries that were reported um, to the Florida State Health Department, um, their general surgeries as opposed to other kind of uh, specialized type of surgeries. We also link these to uh, a file from the American Medical Association that gives information about the surgeons, which is how we identified IMGs and USMGs. 
So I've got a little snapshot of the, the table here that kind of what the data looked like. And you can see there's uh, in, in this data, we have kind of a rich description of what happened for each operation here. We know the unique IDs for the surgeon in the hospital where the operation uh, occurred. We know uh, what procedure was performed. We have some demographic information about the patients. We have some health history variables, like are they, are they, do they have a history of congestive heart failure or cancer or dementia? We also have some process related variables uh, related to what happened to the patient once they arrived at the hospital, such as were they admitted through the emergency room or not. So each of these rows give you, gives you kind of a little story about what happened to the patient. What we're missing though, is an understanding of why certain patients were treated by IMGs and others were treated by USNGs. And we can actually see in the data that this is definitely not random, um, like the randomized trial I described. Uh, just as one example, we have 58% uh, of IMG surgeries um, performed on patients who came into the emergency room and only 50% of USMG um, operations are, uh, are done on ER patients. So this is a big deal for our outcome, which is 30-day mortality, because if you're admitted through the emergency room, you know, no matter what is going on with you, in general, you're gonna be more likely to, to die within 30 days after surgery. And so already before any surgeons walk into the room, we have a problem where the IMG patients are more at risk for 30-day uh, for mortality than USMG patients. This is just one of several different um, differences we saw between the, the groups, uh, but one of the more worrying ones. So we need some way to remove this confounding um, in order to measure that something close to the true causal effect. Um, there's a lot of different ways. This is the online causal inference seminar, right? So there's a lot of, we all know that there's a lot of different ways to remove confounding uh, due to observed variables. I'm gonna focus today on matching. The idea of matching in this context is really simple. Each IMG operation or treated unit, um, we're gonna pair to a similar looking USMG operation or control. And then we're gonna analyze these matched pairs as though they came from the randomized trial I talked about a couple of slides ago. So um, this is not always a good idea. We need a couple of things to be true for this to work well for us. One is that unmeasured confounders need to be absent. And I'll come back to this assumption and ways we can think about relaxing it at the end of the talk. The other thing that we need is we need for these pairs to be, uh, you know, uh, actually ref reflect important degrees of similarity between the patients. So usually we talk about this either in terms of the patients having similar propensity scores to so similar probabilities of treatment or being similar in their uh, potential outcome model. Um, again, lots of different ways to do this. You don't have to use matching. Uh, I think some of the main benefits of matching are keeping analysis and design separate. The matching step here doesn't use any of the outcomes. It's all about removing the confounding. You can experiment with a lot of different match designs. And then once you've chosen a match design, you can go on and analyze the outcomes without worrying about post-selection inference issues that sometimes come up when you're fitting many different regression models. In addition, it's very easy to describe what you're doing here to um, uh, uh, collaborators and to get their input about how, how good the match designs are and, uh, and, and, and keep that um, uh, involve them in that way. So I think there's a lot of benefits here. Uh, the challenge with matching is when you're sitting down to run a match design like this is figuring out what exactly should go into forming these pairs. Usually you're solving some kind of optimization problem here. You have to decide what, what's my objective function? What, what do I care about in, in order to construct the best set of pairs? And there's actually a lot of debate about this within the literature on matching. Some of the different things people have suggested that are, are a good idea to optimize when you're forming matched pairs are balanced covariates. So this would be just making sure that the, for any variable in our study, the distribution of this variable across the matched treated units and the matched controls is similar, uh, kind of an aggregate measure of similarity. And this is similar to the balance we get in a randomized experiment. A related but somewhat distinct goal is having close pairs. So this means not just um, caring about the histogram of a particular variable being similar between the matched treated and the matched control groups, but it actually means Every time you look at an individual pair, you want those two individuals to be close on this variable. So if you can match uh, really closely all the time, then you, you generally get marginal balance as well, although that's not a 100% guarantee. Um, this has slightly different motivations. It, uh, in particular, if you match really closely on pairs, you tend to get much more homogeneous responses and uh, reduce sensitivity to bias. And then of course, there's other things you care about with these match pairs, right? Like getting a lot of them. If you have a very small match sample, you may not have power to detect anything. You may, and if you've thrown away most of, say, the IMG operations in our study, it may be hard to know what effect you're measuring or to, to, to generalize 
or interpret your results in a meaningful way. So there's sort of, you can find uh, papers that talk about all of these different goals and that develop matching methods around them. Usually the most of the off the shelf methods kind of focus on one of these things as the primary objective and optimize it as well as possible. And then they may pay some attention to the other goals in some kind of lower priority uh, way. Uh, so just as an example, optimal propensity score matching, which is maybe the most common thing you see done out there. Uh, this prioritizes having a large match sample. Um, so you keep all of the treated units no matter what. And then subject to this, you match uh, people as closely as possible on an estimated propensity score. And there's actually no direct attention paid to balance, except you know, to the degree close pairing, pairing induces balance. So each of these methods uh, is, is fine on its own and has, has some kind of justification. But the problem is you end up with very different looking matches, depending on which of these things you pick as your primary goal. And sometimes all of the different off the shelf things are unsatisfactory for one reason or another. And this is kind of what we ran into in the IMG USMG match. We had a variable that was really challenging to balance surgical experience. So it turned out 25% of IMG operations were performed by a surgeon with 30 or more years of experience and only about 4% of USMG operations in our data set were. This is a big problem because we want really want the study to identify impacts of medical education rather than um, uh, differences in surgeon experience, which could also be related to outcomes. So we want to make sure that we're balancing this variable well in our study. Unfortunately, the off-the-shelf things we tried didn't really work. Um, we tried a method called sparse optimal matching, which keeps uh, as much of the treated group as possible and then works on balance subject to that. We had a large sample here, but the balance wasn't very good. Um, we also tried matching exactly on experience. I believe this is uh, on you know, deciles of experience. So it wasn't even exact on how many years of experience you'd had. And still we ended up with, um, although the balance was great here, we ended up throwing away 70% of our data. So this was also an unacceptable match, but in a very different way. So the, the kind of the dilemma we're in here is we're trying these different off the shelf methods that focus on one goal at the expense of others. And uh, what we really want is something that's kind of intermediate between these two matches, maybe something that throws away some portion of our treated group, but hopefully a small portion. And maybe it doesn't drive the imbalance on experience all the way down to zero, but maybe it gets it close. Um, but that match probably isn't defined by strictly optimizing any one of our objectives here, sample size or balance. It's striking some kind of trade-off between them. So the big question is how do we produce and consider these kind of intermediate solutions that aren't strictly optimal with respect to any one of our different objective functions in play? And this is a problem that comes up all the time in practice and matching. You, you fix the one thing about your match and something else breaks over there and uh, it can feel really frustrating to try and uh, uh, figure out how to, how, get, how to get all these things in balance at once. And so the, the big contribution of our work is uh, applying multi-objective optimization methods to matching and thinking about uh, just how do we operate in a space where we have multiple uh, design goals and we're not sure a priori which one should take top priority over the others. So uh, I guess the contribution here is a couple of pieces. One is just really focusing on the idea of Pareto optimality and thinking about how this kind of abstract concept from multi-objective optimization is helpful in matching. And then the, the bigger piece of it is figuring out um, how do we actually do computation and, and choose a match uh, in practice for analysis when we're working with the Pareto optimal set. This is a much bigger group of solutions than we're used to working with in matching. It's a very heterogeneous group of solutions. So we need some tools that will help us explore and study and understand this, um, this set of solutions. And then I'll show how these ideas work out in the context of the IMG USMG study. So let me start by talking about uh, Pareto optimality a little bit. Um, so this is a very old idea. Um, the, the basic idea is that if you have an optimization problem and you have a feasible solution uh, that, and we, ha we have multiple objective functions, then a, another so this solution X is Pareto optimal. If there exists no other solution, x prime, uh, which is at least as good on all of the objective functions and strictly better on at least one. So I find this easier to understand by looking at a picture like this. Here are the red points are Pareto optimal solutions with respect to our two objective functions, f1 and f2, that we're trying to minimize. Uh, what that means is if you pick any red point, usually there's a way to get a better value of f1, sort of if you look to the left here, or a better value of f2 if you look to the right, but there's no way to do better on both of them at once. So you can imagine something like sample size over here or the number of, of treated units we've kicked out of our match. And then this is a measure of imbalance. 
there's some matches up here that are very uh, large but have poor in, poor balance. There's other matches down here that are very small but have good balance. And then there's kind of all these different ways we can look at things in the middle. So this is kind of what we're going for. And intuitively, if I told you I cared about balance and sample size, but I wasn't willing to put any a priori weighting on which was more important, this would sort of be a natural group of solutions to look at. So that's kind of the motivation for why free optimality is, is important to us. There's been a few other works that have explored this idea in the context of matching before, in particular, this 2012 paper by Rosenbaum and this 2017 paper by King and co-authors. These uh, papers give nice tools at, for very specific situations. So in particular, the, the Rosenbaum paper looks at um, the specific trade-off between having a large match and having close uh, covariate distances. The King paper looks at the trade-off between match sample size and covariate imbalance and uh, is focused on the case of matching with replacement, where you allow the same control units to be used across different match sets. What we're trying to do is just generalize these ideas. Our framework subsumes both these methods as special cases, although um, we don't make this matching with replacement part requirement. So the King method is a little, uh, has some uh, you know, computational advantages because it's in this special sort of especially tractable case. Um, but the basic idea of what we're doing is we're, we're, we're going a little more abstract and we're trying not only to think about um, uh, you know, different kinds of matching, but also uh, different objective functions and to be very general about what kind of objective functions we're considering. Um, so I guess to, to talk about what we did specifically, I need to go into the details of minimum cost network flow optimization, which is the general way that we're thinking about matching. But before I do that, maybe I will pause for some questions. Sure, we have one question. Uh, it reads, do you have covariates for the surgeons? Yeah, that's a great question. So I guess um, uh, in particular, I mentioned surgeon experience uh, is one. Um, I think that's the main one we're using here. Um, you know, I, actually, I, I, I take that back. We also had a surgeon volume variable. So surgeon experience is how many years they've been practicing. Surgeon volume is how many uh, operations have they performed over, and I believe that's over kind of a, uh, a two-year period or something. Um, I don't remember if that's in the data or prior to the data. Uh, I think those are the only two we ended up using um, because the, the master file didn't have a lot of more granular data. But uh, uh, that would be interesting if we, we've been able to obtain more, more of the surgeon covariates. Okay, great. Well, maybe you can move on. Okay, yeah. All right, so I mentioned minimum cost network flow optimization. This is sort of the abstract way we'll be thinking about matching problems in order to be really general about what we say about them. So minimum cost network flow optimization this is a, an old problem in operations research. The idea is you have a graph, you have uh, nodes and edges, certain nodes, a, a commodity of some kind is being produced. And at other nodes, there's a demand for this commodity to be delivered. You can send the commodity over the edges, but each edge has an upper bound about how much it can carry. And it also has a cost per unit flow you send over it. So the optimization problem is just find the cheapest way to send all the flow from the source nodes to the sync nodes. And you, so you're choosing these decision variables on the edges, which say how much a commodity is passing through. Um, Mathematically, it just looks like this. We have a linear objective function and a constraint set. The constraint I've just represented as one big letter here. All that it uh, says is that the flows are non-negative and that flow is preserved, meaning that if I send three units of commodity into this node, three units also have to come out um, unless there's a supply or a demand. So these problems are interesting uh, among other reasons because they can produce integer solutions without an explicit integer constraint. So uh, you know, there's no uh, nothing in the set F that says X has to be an integer. But if you set up the problem the right way and you solve it in the right way, you always get integers out. So this helps ex explain the link to matching because in matching, we really care about getting integer solutions. We want to match each unit to one control, not to 50 different controls with varying sort of um, fractional uh, weights. So um, it, 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 in order to have this integer property, though, it's really important you can't add extra constraints to this problem. Uh, the only constraints in the problem have to be this the script, the script F. So that means you have to represent any constraints you care about as part of a network. So just to show how we can package up matching into this form and get these nice quick solutions, here's a, a, a picture of a really simple matching problem as a network flow. We have our treated units, we have our controls. Here, the only thing we really care about other than keeping all the treated units is having close pairs. And so we'll put a cost on each of these treated control edges related to how similar those units are on the covariates, maybe a Holonovus distance or a propensity score or something. And then the, the flow problem has to figure out all the best way to send each the flow from each treated unit through a control to the sink. 
and it has to choose these treated control pairs in such a way that the total cost is as low as possible. So it's exactly what we were going for. You can also do add some things to the network here if you want to represent other objective functions. So here we're fixing the sample size to keep all the treated units. If we wanted to allow for variable sample sizes, we could add edges to the network here um, by which a treated unit could be excluded from the match. If the flow goes through this edge, instead of through a control unit, this treated unit will no longer be participating in the match. So depending on how many units get sent through here, we can now vary the sample size in our match. Uh, just as another example, if we care about marginal balance, so having not just into pairs be close, but overall distributions of some variable across the treated group and the control group be similar, we can do something like this. Here we've got a binary variable with yellow and blue as categories. Um, to, to, to pay attention to marginal balance on this, I've added these nodes here that collect the number of controls chosen in each category. So all the yellow controls we pick are routed now through this node. All the blue controls, their flow is routed through here. By restricting the flow out of these nodes to be equal to the counts in the treated group, we now force the match to essentially always make the, the, the marginal distribution of our controls with respect to this variable equal to the marginal distribution of the treated. There's no way we can select two yellow con controls because then we won't be able to send the flow through here. If you want these numbers to be similar but not identical, then you can add a couple edges like this with a, with a cost. And so now the, the network will try and get the numbers identical, but if, if it can't get it exactly, we now have a way to sort of measure how, how different those, these distributions are by adding up the flow across these, these edges here. Um, so I went through this kind of fast. Um, uh, if you didn't follow all the details of kind of how the network is exactly measuring all these things, I think that's okay. The big picture is that we can represent lots of kinds of matching problems as network flow problems. And by setting up the network in a clever way, we can measure lots of different kinds of objective functions. So going back to kind of the big picture, we are taking these problems, which uh, traditionally have been solved with a single objective function. You, you pick one set of costs for all these edges, and then you optimize that set of costs. And we're going to think about what if you have two different sets of costs you're interested in. So here, for instance, thinking about this network, we could decouple the pair costs from the, the, the imbalance penalties. Uh, so we'd have one objective function that just pays attention to how close my pairs are, and another set of costs or another objective function that pays attention to how imbalanced the marginal distributions are. And um, now what we're going to do is working with, this, with, a, with a fixed network and these two different objective functions, we're going to look for Pareto optimal solutions. Okay, so I mentioned we have these fast available methods to solve uh, a network flow problem when there's a single objective function. So essentially the way we're going to get Pareto optimal solutions is we're going to repeatedly solve the problem with different individual objectives in order to uh, sort of generate uh, solutions that are Pareto optimal. And there's two different ways to think about doing this, one which is really simple and clear, but computationally hard, and another way which we actually end up using. So let me start with the simple and clear one. Here the idea is we have two objective functions, so let's just choose to optimize one of them under a constraint on the other. So again, working with this, uh, say we this uh, objective function is sample size, or how many treated units we're kicking out of the match. Um, this constraint says, let's make sure we're kicking out no more than, say, 10% of our sample, if we choose A uh, to be 10% of our total. Then what this problem is asking for is to find me the best balance I can subject to losing no more than 10% of my sample. And if we choose A to be 20% instead, then it's finding the best balance subject to losing no more than 20% of the sample. And you know, it, it turns out that this problem will always produce a Pareto optimal solution. And if you solve for enough different values of A, then you get the full Pareto optimal set. So that's great. Um, and this kind of makes sense if you think about that picture I drew at the beginning, which where we had a curve of the Pareto optimal points that kind of look like this. Here, what we're doing is we're drawing a line through that curve. We're moving that line up and down, and we're kind of finding the points of intersection. So it makes sense that we'd sort of be able to map out this curve. The problem with this is that the problem itself is not very tractable. What we have is a network problem with a network constraint, but then we've added on this side linear constraint. And that means if we want integer solutions, we're actually going to have to use an explicit integer constraint in integer programming methods. And that's going to be bad for computation, especially in large problems like the IMG USMG study. So here is a kind of a hack we can use to get around that. And this is, instead of constraining one of the uh, objective functions, we'll just penalize it and put it right in the main objective function. Um, so this, of course, is a very common trick in optimization, right? What's nice about this is we get it back to being a regular network problem now. This is something that we can solve quickly and solve repeatedly. In other ways, I think this problem is a little less satisfying. In particular, I don't really like this penalty parameter row as some, it's not as interpretable as this value A. 
you know, if I'm working with a collaborator, it's really easy to explain what I'm doing when I impose this constraint A. It means we're, it's going to control exactly how much of the sample we can lose, and it's, it's on an interpretable scale. This value rho, I'm not sure, you know, it, rho depends in a subtle way on the relative scalings of these two objective functions, what exactly it's going to do. It's a little hard to describe why I'm picking a particular value of rho. But one thing that's nice about this problem is it turns out any solution to this problem is also a solution to the previous kind of computationally hard constrained problem under a particular choice of A. So every time I pick a row value and I solve, I, I can, I've sort of induced a solution to the other problem for some choice of A. I don't get to pick what those A's are, but uh, nevertheless, this gives me a way to interpret the results of this problem in terms of that other kind of clearer problem. So that's kind of nice. Um, and, and like I said, because this problem is tractable, we can quickly solve for a lot of different row values and generate a bunch of different Pareto optimal points. There is a gap here. This problem isn't quite the same as the other one. And what that means is we can't actually guarantee recovery of every single Pareto optimal point. There are sort of pathological solutions that um, are, are, we're, we're going to miss if we solve for all the different possible values of rho. But for a number of reasons, I'm not very worried about those missing solutions. One is kind of a technical reason I'm not going to go into, by which I feel like those problems are a little worse, or those, those solutions are a little worse than the ones we will get. A more basic uh, reason I'm not interested is because in practice, we're never going to look at all of the Pareto optimal solutions anyway. In a problem like the IMG USMG match, we have 20,000 treated units we're starting with. That means if one of our objectives is sample size, we have a Pareto optimal solution with 19,000 matched pairs and another Pareto optimal solution with uh, 18,990 matched pairs. You know, those, those Pareto optimal solutions are similar enough in sample size and probably similar enough in whatever else we're trading off against sample size that I'm not really going to care about the distinction between them. Um, you know, at the level I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the problem, they're going to look almost identical. Another problem is that um, some Pareto optimal solutions will exist that are just way extreme in one direction or the other. There's probably a Pareto optimal match with only five pairs, and I'm sure those are really excellent pairs, but I don't care about the match because I need a lot more than five pairs, and I know that kind of no matter what. So um, now that we have a tool that can generate a bunch of different Pareto optimal solutions, even if it may not get absolutely every one, the real question now is how do we actually make this set smaller? How do we break this down and look at a few representative Pareto optimal solutions rather than trying to sort of compute and process the entire uh, group? And here we get a lot of mileage out of the nice structure of the Pareto optimal set. So it turns out if you take all the Pareto optimal solutions or even some subset of them and you line them up in order of one of your objective functions, so they're increasing or, or non-decreasing, then they'll also be uh, monotone in the other objective function, right? If the if we take these points from the smallest value of f1 to the largest, that, that is exactly the same ordering as the largest value of f2 to the smallest. And in addition, if all these solutions were generated by solving the, the penalized problem, they're also going to be monotone in rho. Um, so what this means is, let's say we've only solved for these three points here, one, two, and three, with values rho one, rho two, and rho three. Um, well, even if we don't see any of these other red points in the picture, we can draw boxes, little bounding boxes here between the points we have generated. And this will give us sort of bounds on the location of the other red points. Um, so in particular, this means that if we solve for point one and point two and they were very similar to one another, we probably don't care about seeing any additional points in this box because we already know kind of what they're going to look like. And that means in particular, we can avoid solving for any penalties between row one and row two. Similarly, if row one, we look at row one and we see its value for objective function F2 is too high, that this is not an acceptable level on this design goal, then we can forget about solving for anything, any values of the penalty less than row one, because those are going to be uh, as uh, worse or as bad or worse than um, the solution on that objective function. Uh, so maybe all we really need to look at here now to, to get a, a clear picture of the Pareto optimal set, or at least the solutions we're considering using from the Pareto optimal set is values of uh, row between row two and row three. And this gives, gives us a, a clear way to iterate with this algorithm. So just kind of laying out in steps, the idea here is you solve the penalized problem for a large value of row and a small value of row, and then you solve for a grid with a few intermediate row values, and then you can sort of rinse and repeat with any uh, interval among these different, the sequence of rows you've got now, where you think there's interesting solutions that are sufficiently different from the ones on the ends you might have missed. So uh, when I say algorithm here, obviously this is a human in the loop algorithm. When you know the step three, where you look at what's interesting, right? That's very that's a little bit vague. Um, 
Some people may find that unsatisfying. This is kind of a general feature of multi-objective optimization. Uh, you're going to generate a bunch of solutions, and at some point, you have to bring in a decision maker who's going to choose among these solutions by some criteria that's usually not a direct part of the multi-objective optimization problem. I actually think this is a, this is uh, potentially a, a nice feature of the algorithm. In particular, if you're working with a collaborator, step three is a great time to bring in your collaborator, show them a few batches, and you can do some reasoning about the, the quality of your confounding removal that, that draws on scientific intuition as well as on you know whatever you have as a statistician. I also want to mention that I feel like if, if this feels sort of a little less automated than one might like, it's still a step forward over current practice in matching where people kind of throw a lot of things at the wall until some match looks good and then you sort of go ahead with that. Um, so anyway, this is sort of the method we're proposing and uh, 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 as I hope you'll see in, in the last part of the talk, there's some advantages in practice with, with real matching problems. We've also got an R package here that's coming out soon uh, with a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, Shi Chao Han. Uh, before I get back into the application, um, I'm going to pause and take some additional questions now. Sure. Um, so we have another question. Uh, it says, in general, are you worried about the cursive dimensionality when there are more than a few covariates? Yeah, this is a really good question. So um, I think there's a number of different ways this could come up. So one um, possibility, right, is if you're thinking about balance on each covariate, say, or similarity in the pairwise distance on each covariate, then actually, you know, I've been focusing in, in my presentation so far on having two objective functions. And here you could, for instance, have, you know, K or a very large number of objective functions. That is a problem that is very hard to solve. Um, uh, base, the short answer is Pareto optimality still works fine for this. In the abstract, you can still think about this Pareto optimal set. But the method I ju I've just described here for how you generate the Pareto optimal solutions, that breaks down as soon as you have three or more objective functions. So I think this is one of the big open problems in this area is figuring out how do you do this all at once for many objective functions rather than just taking them two at a time as I'm going to do in, in what follows. I think um, another way to look at this is thinking about um, what if you're going to take some kind of summary measure of, uh, you, you have a bunch of covariates, but you're willing to sort of look at a particular covariate distance that summarizes them. And then it's a question of which covariate distance is best. Um, sometimes you can use a statistical model to help you figure out kind of what uh, the right way to sort of take all of these covariates and summarize their similarity in a dimension reduced way. Um, uh, but yeah, but it's kind of a trade off there between making more parametric assumptions that will allow you to reduce the dimension of your problem and just dealing with the trade off among many different things if you want to be more robust. So that is a big challenge. All right, thanks. And uh, maybe one more question is, uh, could you comment on the difference between this method and cardinality matching? Yes, this is a really good question. So um, yeah, cardinality matching is uh, a particular method of matching. It, it kind of falls into that framework earlier of a strict uh, optimality, right? So in cardinality matching, the, the, the primary goal is balance. You specify a bunch of balance constraints, which are um, essentially required to hold no matter what. And then subject to that, you maximize the sample size. Um, so I think in, uh, at least in that framing, it's different from this method because it enforces strict priority. It doesn't allow you to sort of play with the relative importance of the goals. But I think in practice, you can use cardinality matching in a framework a bit like this because you can, you can sort of gradually relax the, um, the tightness of your balance constraints. And I, uh, you know, essentially, I think the same Pareto optimality uh, result applies to cardinality matching as you think about gradually changing, to changing the, your balance tuning parameters to be more and more permissive. So I think if you're, if you're using cardinality matching rather than network stuff, you can use all these same ideas and just change the balance thresholds as kind of your, uh, your penalty here that you're varying. Great, thanks. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, we should move on for now. Great, yeah. Okay, so I'll just kind of re return to the application here. Just as a recap, you know, there's several different goals we care about in constructing similar groups of IMGs and USMGs. One, which I mentioned, is balancing surgical experience in years. We have to pick some measure for this. Uh, I'm going to focus on minimizing the total variation in balance on experience deciles between groups. This has the advantage of turning this into a, a nominal variable, which works well with network methods. Another thing we care about is having pairs of patients that are similar in their risk for 30-day mortality. So here I'm going to focus on uh, kind of six of the, of the much larger group of variables that we have that, based on scientific judgment and also in the data, are going to be most linked to, data, to the outcomes. Um, so this is which procedure you're receiving, uh, a risk uh, index, um, patient sex, and emergency room status. Um, 
and we're going to minimize the sum of melanobis distances calculated using these variables to make sure we're getting patients somewhat homogeneous in their outcome, expected out potential outcomes. Then finally, we want to retain as many IMG operations as possible. Uh, and this a big reason for this is generalizability. We'd like to make some broader statement about the kinds of uh, what you know defects that are present for the kinds of patients that tend to be treated by IMGs. So basically, I'm going to build a network that represents all of these different things in different parts of the network structure, sort of putting together a few of those networks I showed you earlier. And then I'm going to look at trade-offs between these goals two at a time. First of all, we're going to try and keep the sample size large, and we're going to try and reduce, uh, you know, give up a little bit in terms of how close the pairs are to try and improve balance. And then uh, after that, we'll look at actually reducing our sample size in order to improve balance a bit. So here's a table that summarizes the trade-off for the close pairing versus balance. Here, each column represents a different match that was produced by the penalized problem. And the row value here at the top gives the penalty used to produce it. You can see the objective functions changing here. Uh, you know, this one is going up as we reduce attention to pair distances and increase attention to balance by increasing the penalty. Um, down here at the bottom of the table, these are sort of more interpretable versions of these uh, or closely related quantities to these objective functions. This gives the rate of exact matching on our prognostic variables that went into the melanobis distance. And this gives a standardized difference on experience. So the big picture here, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, these numbers are going down slightly. The imbalance is also going down. What's interesting here is these numbers go down a little bit. You know, we're giving up only a tiny amount of, uh, you know, we go from having 92% of our patients with exactly the same procedure in pair to 90%. That's not a big change. On the other hand, we're getting quite a big reduction in standardized difference in experience. We're going down from almost half a standard deviation to under a quarter of a standard deviation. So the, this seems to be a, a trade-off that's worth doing. We're probably happy to give up a little bit here with the pairs in order to reduce imbalance. The problem is that the imbalance over here on the right side of the table is still way too big, right? We would really like this to be below a fifth of a standard deviation. So that takes us to our other trade-off here. Now we're going to, uh, we're, we're sort of going to ignore pairing and we're going to trade off balance against sample size. Uh, so now this is a slightly different penalized problem. The penalty refers to the cost of kicking a treated unit out of the match. So with a high penalty, we're going to keep all the treated units or as many of them as we can as this penalty gets reduced, we get more and more comfortable kicking thing, pe uh, people out of the match. And you know, when we go to extremes, we end up losing like 70% of our sample. Uh, what's great though, is unlike those off the shelf methods I showed you at the beginning of the talk, which basically found this match and this match, the trade-off algorithm allows us to look at these intermediate solutions. And we're now finding matches where we lose only 10, 15% of the sample. And we're getting almost as much bias reduction, balance, imbalance reduction, excuse me, as we do um, in this very extreme match. So just to show you this in picture form, here is the, you know, this is kind of the, uh, you know, the two objective function plots where we're, you can see the Pareto optimal solutions here for close pairing and balance lying along a curve like this. Again, there's not much change here in terms of the quality of pairing. So we're probably comfortable going to this end of the plot. Um, but again, the balance is too bad here. Over here is the trade-off between balance and sample size. And here you can see with those extreme solutions, which are unsatisfactory, but we're also able to recover this nice group of solutions down here, which really kind of do what we were hoping to do from the beginning. So this is kind of a nice win for our method. It gives us a, a bunch of matches here, which are uh, significantly better in terms of the, the overall profile of what we care about than the one here and the one here. So now we can actually go ahead and do outcome analysis. We can pick one of these matches and we can go ahead and analyze it as though it were a randomized trial. Um, you know, these, again, these matches are very similar to one another. It probably doesn't matter uh, a ton which of these exactly we pick. We chose match K, um, which is one of these matches. It has 16,419 match pairs. So that's a nice big sample size. And it's also got, um, it's similar enough that we feel comfortable, uh, at least as an initial step, thinking about it uh, as though it were a randomized trial. So let's do that now. In this sample, we have 1.5% of patients, uh, of IMG patients who it died within 30 days of surgery. 1.7% of USMG patients that died within 30 days of surgery. Um, so it doesn't look like a big difference. And sure enough, if we do a McNamara test, which essentially assumes that we, we randomly assign treatment within each pair, and it's going to generate a null distribution by going back through and reshuffling outcomes or treatment labels within each pair without changing the outcomes. Um, you know, you do this a thousand times and you get a thousand different versions of your test statistic under the null, which you can compare to the, the observed difference. Um, so yeah, so, so this was not able to reject. Essentially, this difference is not inconsistent with what we'd see 
if there were really no difference between these surgeons and um, uh, uh, in our inner match. So let's see if we can say something a little more, um, uh, a little stronger. Can we actually reject the possibility here that there's a large IMG effect? And uh, to do this, we need some measure of effect size. So we'll use something called the attributable effect. This is the number of lives that would have been saved if USMGs had done all the surgeries. So if this number is large and positive, it means USMGs are a lot better. Lots of lives would have been saved if they'd taken over and run the whole show. If this number is large and negative, it means that actually more people would have died if USMGs had taken over and IMGs are actually the better uh, performing group. So the way we, we set up this test to reject the possibility of a large A is we do two one-sided tests against some effect threshold on A. So first we're gonna test whether IMGs are uh, better by at least some number iota of lives saved. And then we'll also test whether IMGs are worse by at least some number uh, of lives saved iota. If both of these things reject, then we've shown equivalence in sort of the biostatistics language for these things. Um, so we chose a value of iota um, somewhat arbitrarily as a change in the age uh, 75 mortality rate uh, or one fourth the uh, the age 75 mortality rate, which corresponded to about a 1% difference in 30 day mortality. So we're gonna try and reject the possibility that there's a difference of more than 1% in mortality in either direction. Um, and we're able to do that. If we rerun the McNamara test with the, with, you know, altered for these different hypotheses, then um, we're able to reject both the possibility that IMGs are better by 1% mortal in mortality rate and are worse by 1% mortality rate. Um, okay, so that's kind of, the, the finding here, or at least the, the naive finding, um, doing these three tests together, there's some interesting things that I don't have time to go into, but they're described nicely in this paper. Um, the, the last thing I do wanna comment about this analysis is to go back to this question of unobserved confounding. So uh, every all the work I've been doing in this talk is all about um, essentially observed confounders, right? We, we observed all these variables. There's all of these different metrics we've defined in terms of these observed variables that we're trying to trade off one another to make the matches as, as nice as possible. We've given no attention whatsoever to observe, unobserved confounders. And if they're present, all of this analysis framework I've just used on the last two slides falls apart because the McNamara test is based on the idea that people in matched pairs are equally likely to receive treatment. And if there are latent confounders we haven't addressed, if IMG patients are actually subtly different from USMG patients, then there will be this imbalance in their treatment probabilities that won't be captured in the test. What we can do here is a sensitivity analysis. So we can say, what if the true probabilities of treatment within matched pairs actually differed by some factor gamma uh, on the odd scale? Uh, if gamma equals to one, then we're saying that probabilities are equal. That's basically the test we've just done. But for gamma larger than one, we'll allow some, some degree of unmeasured bias to creep in. And using methods uh, due to Rosenbaum, we can calculate the worst case p-value over this family of distributions. So basically, um, under all of the different possible choices for you know, um, permutation probabilities within our pairs, if we choose the worst one in each pair, the one that will make our p-value as large as possible, then are we still able to reject the null or not? And if so, then our results essentially hold up under at least this degree of unmeasured confounding. So in particular, we're gonna repeat this procedure for larger and larger values of gamma and report the value, the, the breakdown point where um, the value of gamma for which our, our results are reversed. So again, thinking about the specific context of our study, the kind of bias we're worried about here because we have an equivalence result is that there is a large effect, but a bias masked it. So one version of this would be, maybe the IMGs really are better surgeons, um, but they're treating patients that are, more, that are more at risk or more likely to die due to some unobserved way. So is it possible um, that there's actually a large uh, difference in performance and it's been hidden by a large bias? We're gonna repeatedly test all three of our hypotheses at higher and higher values of gamma, as I've just described. When we do this, we find that, um, you know, the specific number in, on the gamma scale here where things break down is 1.8. And the test that's most sensitive is the test that uh, is the result that um, the IMGs are not much better. Um, this is the test that stops rejecting at gamma equals 1.8. So what does this mean? Gamma equals 1.8 is then interpretable. It basically means that we, um, in, in order for our study results to be wrong, sort of the most, uh, uh, the weakest point in our analysis here is the possibility that actually IMGs are better and there's an unobserved confounder of, um, that both increases the odds of treatment by an IMG by fivefold and simultaneously multiplies the odds of death by 2.5. So if this were the case, 
then it could be that our results are wrong and IMGs are actually better by at least 1% in mortality rate. So, you know, this, this isn't sort of a definitive statement. Um, such a confounder could exist, right? It's unobserved, we don't know, but at least it puts some, uh, you know, if someone's gonna come in and criticize our study, they have to come up with a confounder that at least sort of meet, meet, meets this profile that's extremely highly related to your likelihood of being treated by an IMG. And that also is pretty um, highly predictive of, or, or is a major risk factor for 30-day uh, mortality. Okay, so that's essentially it. Um, just in closing, I wanna comment on a few of the sort of uh, implications on the method side. And some of the questions actually have touched on a number of these already. So one point is that these penalized and directly constrained problems I've introduced are not at all new. I mean, if you're familiar with the optimal matching literature, you've seen various uh, kind of uh, approaches like this proposed where people can put a constraint on some uh, balance metrics or other things and, and optimize uh, a different goal, or they use some penalty approach to, uh, to take a linear combination of several goals. I think uh, kind of, as I alluded to when discussing cardinality matching, I think the real contribution here isn't the problem itself, but it's sort of a shared framework for thinking about solving re repeated solutions to this problem under different values of the tuning parameters. I think um, if you, if you are, are thinking about all of the solutions you're running as you're repeatedly doing matches as part of this shared framework of exploring the Purdue optimal set, I think that adds some very useful structure and helps you be more systematic about finding the best possible match. And again, I think that applies very widely across matching methods, even not just the network flow methods here. Um, I also mentioned multidimensional trade-offs. The theory is straightforward. The practical exploration of the space of solutions is not. I think that's a big thing we need to figure out to, to make this method really good. Uh, the final thing that I think is potentially interesting here is right now I've just sort of handed you this, the pre optimal solution set and say, you know, look at them and pick one that looks good. Ideally, I think if you, if you had a strong statistical model for your problem, the statistical model could provide a lot of guidance about how exactly to strike this trade-off. What is the relative importance of balance and sample size? Uh, and you know, there are a lot of approaches out there where people have used this a priori to pick an objective function, but I think uh, looking at all of your options and sort of doing this post hoc, there may be some advantages to that. And that's something I'm looking forward to exploring, but I'm out of time, so I will stop there. Thanks very much. All right, thank you very much for the very nice talk, Sam. Uh, we're now switching over to the discussion. So we'll have uh, Magdalena uh, present some slides. And after that, uh, Sam will be able to respond also, we'll take some more questions if we have time left after that. Okay, Magdalena, whenever you're ready. Yes, sorry, let me just make sure it's pleasant there. Oh, where's my... Oh, there it is. Great. Great. So um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, reading this paper, and I think that uh, Sam's presentation made made it like very clear. I'm gonna just skim over kind of the the summary and the main take takeaway points that I got from this, and just discuss a little bit my uh, some of the the questions and and comments that I had while reading uh, this paper. So I think this paper is particularly interesting because it tackles this big question on um, how do we actually match? And, and that's a huge kind of uh, question in, in this kind of literature. And a lot of the times we kind of don't necessarily focus on the optimality of balancing these different uh, goals. So as uh, Sam presented here, there's a lot of different things that we wanna do while matching. And a lot of the times this uh, different objectives are kind of at odds with one another. And we tend to solve them, I think, uh, most commonly in a suboptimal way. So sometimes we want to balance covariance distributions, but at the same time, we want to maximize our sample size to um, get more power, for instance, for a test. And of course, we also want to minimize distance within pairs a lot of the times to also, for instance, um, increase efficiency and also minimize the sensitivity to um, hidden biases. So I think that what this paper does really well is kind of show how we can optimize um, two of these goals at the same uh, time and kind of be more transparent uh, on how we do this and this trade-off. So basically it touches on this optimal trade-off and matching using the part efficiency um, in this objective, uh, this multi-objective function in this case. 
And we're going to find a class of matches that will vary the trade off between these different objectives that we have in mind. So I think that this is also a very nice result in the sense that we can see how um, different match sets will yield um, basically these different trade offs in a very um, straightforward way. Um, I really liked also how they showed this iterative search of the part of optimal solutions because it can be a very difficult problem to solve, especially if we're trying to kind of map out the, the that whole kind of boundary of distribution. And this use of the uh, highly structured um, way that the optimal sets um, are built kind of plays this informative bounds to what we can actually do in practice, which I think is also something that's really important in this sense, because a lot of the times we do have great theoretical ways to do matching, but in practice, it kind of um, be unpractical um, because of computing times, for instance. And in that sense, even though um, this paper shows that computing times can be high, depending on the different so, um, objective functions that we have in mind, um, they're still kind of feasible depending on our sample size, for instance, um, and the problem at hand. I think that the contributions to the literature are, um, well, they were also kind of mentioned already in, in the talk, but, um, and I was glad that someone brought up um, cardinality matching because that's one of the first things that came to, my, came to mind when reading the paper. Um, and I think that Sam already kind of mentioned that, but um, in the sense of cardinality matching, for instance, it clearly places some priorities in the way we think about this goal. So, meaning the first one clearly being balanced um, and subject to that, then we try to get the largest sample size. And in this particular paper of suicide and authors, um, in third place, it comes kind of uh, minimizing the distance between uh, within pairs uh, to kind of increase efficiency in that case. Um, it also kind of adds up to uh, optimal subset matching in that case. But again, I think that the main uh, contribution is that it gives us a more general uh, framework to think about some of these things. And again, not necessarily in a particular um, object, in sort of particular objective functions, like in the case of optimal subset matching, but in a more general way where we can tweak this different um, trade offs that we want to um, that we want to work around. So um, I have some comments and questions that again might go a bit beyond the scope of this paper, but I was just curious to know what uh, Sam thought or if he had thought about some of these uh, things, particularly because I know that a lot of the time some things don't uh, end up in a paper, but because you're working on this uh, for so long, uh, some of these questions might have come um, up at some point. So one of the first things that um, I was thinking about when reading the paper was related to external validity. So uh, the paper proposes this way to maximize sample size and links it to this idea of generalizability in the sense that if we have a larger proportion of the treated units uh, matched, of course, that would yield um, greater external validity. But at some point, um, we kind of don't necessarily want the largest match sample, but also we want some sort of uh, representative um, sample to that extent. So I don't know if um, this method could also be kind of tweaked to incorporate um, some sort of target population in the sense that instead of just maximizing sample size, we could also think of minimizing the distance to some sort of population of interest in that sense, or penalizing not just um, when we lose certain um, units in the, in the treated sample, that cannot be matched, um, if that could kind of be penalized for loss of representativeness, depending on which um, of these units kind of fall off our match set. Um, one of the second things that also came to mind, and this was also because it came up um, in a paper that we um, had a couple of years ago with Jose Luis Abreta and also Juan Pablo Vilma, is about the running time of these sort of problems. So, of course, um, with larger sample size and depending on the different objective functions, this can actually become very computationally expensive. Um, but I was also wondering whether um, some sort of projection, kind of in a similar way to mixed integer programming matching, a 
optimization problem could provide some sort of faster computational time, particularly for the problem where we're balancing or doing the trade-off between balance and sample size, which I think that sometimes is one of the most common problems that, that we face, right? We want kind of distributional uh, balancing covariates, and at the same time, we don't want to lose so many um, units. So in that sense, kind of move from this network flow problem, uh, where we're kind of turning on and off these different edges to just simply something smaller, where just uh, we're solving on whether different units in the treated um, group are included in this match set or not, and whether that can make it um, at least faster for those for that particular trade up in that sense. Um, and finally, and one thing that I thought that was very interesting, and again, maybe it's touching a little bit on, on what Sam mentioned at the end of this about how do we choose which um, solution we end up uh, keeping. So I think that the paper uh, mainly states that the, it's kind of up to the researcher in some sense. To, um, to bring in collaborators and things like that, which I think that is actually good because it's a lot of times depends on the context of the problem and a lot of contextual knowledge is useful in that sort of situation. Um, but I don't know if there could be something done in that sense with the different solutions along this kind of Pareto optimal set to see whether um, or how basically the estimated effect changes depending on the researcher's discretion of the solution found. So in the sense that matching, I think does a great job separating the adjustment procedure from the estimation process, as also was previously mentioned. Um, and it's great um, because we can play around with adjustment a lot before actually committing to, to, uh, to a match set. Um, I was just wondering if the fact that we find kind of, even though it's not the whole boundary, some of uh, at least a portion of it, and that could also give us some idea on how the actual estimated effect would change if the researcher's discretion would go either one way um, or the other. Um, overall, I just found the paper like really interesting and particularly useful, again, um, in the sense of, of matching. I think that it clearly shows the advantages of matching as an adjustment method. And again, it also allows kind of changes in the priority of the different objective functions that we have in mind. Um, a lot of the times we do this kind of trade of uh, very suboptimally and <laughs> just um, use our own kind of knowledge or try different things. But this kind of gives a very intuitive way of thinking about these um, different trade offs. And it also, I think, helps make decisions of matching more transparent, which I think it's, it's a great, um, a great contribution in that sense from this paper. And finally, I was just wondering whether this uh, setup was actually applicable to other types of optimization-based matching, such as mixed-inter programming matching, which has other advantages uh, besides network uh, flow uh, problems, because it also allows for matching on covariates a bit more flexible and directly. And some of those properties could also be um, kind of um, uh, attracted in a particular matching uh, context. And whether you think that this could kind of be um, transported to a different setting that's not necessarily uh, network flow problems exclusively. But yeah, thank you for a really great talk. And I think it was a very interesting paper. And looking forward to the, our package, actually. Uh, thank you very much for the nice discussion. Uh, Sam, do you want to quickly respond? Yeah, uh, yeah. Excellent, excellent questions and, and, and points. Um, yeah, so just briefly. Um, so first of all, absolutely. The, uh, all the ideas here, I think, work for mixed integer programming matching as well. Um, basically, I just, um, I, I wasn't ready to write the software to do the the, the trade-offs for mixed integer programming, but the ideas uh, transfer over directly. So I think you can sort of code something up like this very much for uh, for those things. And similarly with uh, generalizability, obviously, if you're moving in, in the mixed integer programming world, then there are already methods out there to do the generalized to 
to optimize balance to an external population, you can actually do that with, within a network flow setting as well. Essentially, in that network I showed that, in, that uh, penalizes marginal imbalance, you can just define the sort of marginal imbalance target as your external population instead of the treated group. And that all works fine as well. So, so that, that does work. Um, on your other points, so yeah, so, so first of all, I think it's, it would have been a really good idea in this talk to have you know, not just the one results for the one match K, but show how does this change if we go to, you know, the, the five matches on either side of it or whatever. And I do think that in practice, people are more comfortable saying, I had to pick any of these matches rather than picking one of those five matches that are similar. Unfortunately, I've lost access to the data, so I can't actually run that analysis. But I do think that, that yeah, that's a very uh, natural kind of, uh, an extra kind of sensitivity analysis you could put on the end. Um, so I think that would be really useful um, to present next time I run one of these studies. Uh, and then uh, uh, the final point, I guess, was, oh yeah, about using, about computation time. Uh, so yeah, so I think if, if you don't care about the pairings, then definitely, um, I, I, my sense, again, I don't know the integer programming uh, and matching literature as well as you do, but my sense is that the, the big boost in, co in computation comes when you stop worrying about the pairing and you just focus on uh, optimizing who's included in the match samples. So yeah, so definitely if you have that case, then there are probably big advantages to using the, the, the integer programming methods. What's interesting is even in that case, the worst case complexity bounds for integer programming are worse than for network flow, but there's this sort of uh, reversal in practice where the methods are faster. So I think, yeah, you probably wanna take advantage of that. The other thing I'd mentioned there is my understanding is a lot of the new integer programming matching methods can also do approximate solutions. And, and there you often may have strong worst case time guarantees. I think this kind of setting might be an excellent place to just be satisfied with approximate Pareto optimal solutions. You know, if you're thinking about just getting a rough sense for what the Pareto optimal set looks like, then probably somewhat approximate solutions are fine. And you can always then go back at the end once you've decided on which group of matches you care about and refine them um, towards optimality. So I think the new tools in the kind of mixed integer programming in world of matching and the, the, the design match package in particular, um, I think uh, would really pair really nicely with these these ideas. All right, uh, thank you so much. I think it's now time to uh, slowly wrap up. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, Sam, for a very nice uh, talk and Magdalena for a very interesting discussion. And next time we're gonna have Isaiah Andrews from Harvard University who will talk about inference on winners. Thank you all for joining today. Hope you have a great week and uh, see you next time.